Green Team Academy podcast, episode 79. Tune in for my interview with Jerry Udelson and hear about his new book, Godfather of Green, an eco-spiritual memoir. If you're ready to make a huge eco-impact fast, then don't forget to head over to greenteamacademy.com. You can join our weekly group coaching program, Team Talks, pre-order the Climate Action Challenge book, and join our Climate Action Challenge as a mentor or ambassador. And with that, let's get back to my interview with Jerry Udelson. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to our podcast live. We're doing an interview with Jerry Udelson today. Um, this has been a kind of fun new thing to do is just to hop on live here with you on Tuesday mornings, 9 a.m. Mountain Time. Um, because every time I've been doing the recordings, I've been thinking, gosh, I wonder if other people have questions or, or want to join me. So I've got a copy of Jerry's book here. It's The Godfather of Green, an eco-spiritual memoir. And um, before we go too far, I just want to say hi, Jerry. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Eight o'clock Pacific, and here I am, bright-eyed and bushy tailed oh. Nice. <laughs> Way to go. Really appreciate that. Um, yeah, so it's nine o'clock here in Denver. And so if you're catching us live, uh, let's see, I'm going to try and have this open so I can see this at the same time. So let me pull that up for a second. Okay, so hopefully I'll be able to see those those questions as they come through. Um, but yes, yeah, so thanks so much for hanging out with us today. Really appreciate you guys taking time to, to um, hear about Jerry's experience. And let me pull up my notes here. So he's, he's done so much, I don't want to miss anything. Um, yeah, so just kind of a quick intro. So Jerry's background is social advocate, environmentalist, engineer, spiritual seeker. Um, he was part of organizing the first Earth Day and then uh, dropped out of grad school and um, pursued spiritual development with an Indian master, Swami Muktananda. Uh, and Jerry is also the author of 12 books on green building and sustainability development, a lead fellow with U.S. Green Building Council, and the name Godfather of Green was from Wired Magazine. Um, and so Jerry's going to be talking about a few different things. And yeah, let's just get on into it right now. So Jerry, how about, why don't you start with telling us why did you, why did you decide to write this book? You know, I, I had finished my last book on green building and I wanted to do something more personal. So I just started the idea of a memoir and, you know, a lot of people write, let's say, autobiographies, but a memoir is supposed to be a little bit deeper look. And it just took on a life of its own. And as I got into it more and more, I began to remember things from my past, remember scenes that were etched in my memory. And it just evolved uh, from this kind of, you know, a career memo to a true memoir. And it took two and a half years to get there but that's, that was the end result. So it was really self-inquiry and wanting to make sense of things for myself and also an exercise in what you can leave out. And, you know, if you want to do day by day for 50 years, it's not going to be really that interesting. So there was also the idea of, well, what's the real story here? What's the, what's the arc of, for the character? You know, where did he stumble? Where did he succeed? Where is he now? And so that was the genesis of the book. Well, I think what really caught my eye when, um, when I first saw the inquiry about should we do a podcast on this was just this, the, the subtitle, 
an eco spiritual memoir um, because I I do think so. My first book was about tuning into inner peace, and that was a really big revelation for me. Was this idea that I kept waiting for people to make me happy, and um, through a bunch of things, meditation and twelve step program, I uh, going to Ghana. I realized that. I can just make myself happy regardless of what's going on. And, and that that kind of coming from that place of, of peacefulness, no matter what's happening is, is so important. And so um, how did you, when, so there was a lot about that in the book and where there's a few things we're going to want to talk about as we go through this podcast, so I don't want to draw it out too long, but how did you go from kind of engineer and, I don't know, typical American, I guess, typical American guy maybe, to somebody that is, took up this, this kind of, this path of spiritual seeking? Well, in my mid-20s, I, I didn't feel right. I knew there was something missing. I had pursued this very high level career and all of a sudden it just didn't work for me anymore. And so I began looking around and began reading a lot of philosophy and poetry and couldn't make sense of any of the spiritual books I read, but I had a girlfriend at the time who was very much more attuned than I was to these things. And so we began looking around together and as luck would have it, we lived in the San Francisco Bay Area at the time, and that was kind of an epicenter in the 1970s for every kind of a spiritual teacher uh, would come through that area. So we began what I like to say is snacking at the spiritual smorgasbord uh, in the area, and eventually one day I ran into this great master and it changed my life. <laughs> like the spiritual smorgasbord. And I would imagine that San Francisco would be, would have a lot of choices. You have to watch that you don't overdo it. <laughs> well, you know, the, the idea is you try different things and you see what resonates. And all of a sudden, one day something resonated really big and I began to explore it. And that really was the beginning for me is following my own inner guidance and learning to trust it over time. And so you worked with a guru, you, you, um, and it, that's an interesting word because I think it has different meanings in different cultures, but why, why do you think that it's so important for somebody that's working in the environmental field, especially to, to have this kind of, this be, have inner work, as part of your, you know, you have this outer career that you're following, but why do you think it's so important to do this inner work? I think what's very important is obviously for anybody, you want to understand life, you want to understand yourself, you want to understand your motivations. And I find that uh, no matter what field you're in, so environmentalism is a field, if you will, that people go into, it's easy to get into a, a mindset of enemies. And I like to say, if you're really doing spiritual work, you can have opponents, but not enemies. An opponent is somebody that you're trying to bring across to your point of view. An enemy is somebody who wants to kill you, right? So it's a different mindset to say, well, I want to go from 30% of the people supporting my point of view to 60%. That means I have to convert, you know, roughly half of my opponents into supporters. And so I do think to be in it for the long haul, you have to have inner strength. And I took as an example in the book, the Mahatma Gandhi, who brought the British Empire down with nothing but his own example and his organizing ability to, to influence others, Nelson Mandela in South Africa, Martin Luther King Jr. in the US, were all people who made love and compassion core elements of their mission. So 
and they worked at it and both Gandhi and King were assassinated, as you know, and Mandela died of old age. So you never know what life is going to bring, but they each were able to affect substantial change um, in a very nonviolent way. And that was an example for me of what you can do if you focus in within, but you have, we all have work to do in the world. And, mm -hmm. and if you're an well, environmentalist, that's your work. And so you do your work, but you, you do it with a sense of grace and a sense of humor at times. Well, and I think that, you know, what the things that you're talking about, the, the other thought part that I thought was so interesting as we start having these discussions is that seeing all the, the uprising right now about people fed up with our racial intolerance and white supremacy and um, all of the, yeah, the, that systemic oppression that is that people are saying enough that what, what you were just talking about was that the leaders of those movements, those historical movements, had that, that inner depth. I remember reading or watching the movie A Long Walk to Freedom um, with Nelson Mandela and, you know, just imagining him in prison, was it 27 years? I mean, it was a long time and how that time period, you know, was probably pretty instrumental in him being able to, to have that kind of depth of character to, to sustain the effort and be able to have those conversations with people and, and get to that other side. And one of the things that, um, one of the lines in there that he said that always stayed with me was, if you know it's inevitable, you won't give up. And I think that's the same with the environment. We know that we can't just continue trashing it forever. Like that just, at some point, things have to change. And so that, that is the reason to not give up. But so, so Jerry, when you're, when you're seeing like the, the demonstrations and people out on the streets now, um, I was just wondering what, what are your thoughts from some of the things that you thought were important um, as, from the demonstrations in the 60s and the 70s? Well, at that time, there were, um, obviously the racial situation was intense in the US. And I grew up in Los Angeles and like many big city police forces, the LAPD thought that its job was to keep black people in their place. And whatever violence it took, that's what it took. And this was common in every big city in the country and so you had, when King was killed, there were riots in over a hundred cities. And we're not talking demonstrations or protests, we're talking riots. And this became, a, then there was a reaction to that, obviously, with the 1968 election. Um, but things changed. You know, we passed all these laws, and I think like a lot of young people then, I thought, well, if you pass laws, that means things are going to change. And in fact, we've been fighting to keep those laws, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, keep those in affirmative action. We've been fighting to keep those in force for the last 50 years. And so we've reached a time now where people realize this has to change. It isn't like a good idea. It's essential for the future of the country. And because you brought up Mandela, it reminded me that one of the things that they did in South Africa after the black majority took over, was they launched these truth and reconciliation commissions. And I think we're going to see that happening throughout the U.S. over the next half decade, where people are going to actually sit down, people who were oppressing black people in South Africa, the whites, sat down with the blacks and owned up to what had been done, and they reconciled because they were gonna to live together forever. The whites weren't gonna leave, the blacks are gonna be in the majority from here on out. And how are we gonna to live together? And so I think this current wave of considering the history, um, tearing down statues to Confederate 
military and political figures is all part of the truth and reconciliation that's going to happen over the next decade. And so that to me is something we didn't do in the 70s. We didn't have this kind of sit down. We just said, well, if we have the political will to change laws and to enforce them, well, that'll make everything better. And obviously it didn't. Right. Yeah. Well, those are, those are good insights. And, and so, you know, the other part that, that you were involved with was the, um, the environmental movement. So there's lots of different kind of movements during the 60s and 70s. And one of the things I'm wondering about is how, how, do, how does the environmental movement make progress um, in the same way, how do we bring that attention to this this crises? And to me, a lot of it is a systemic oppression because you know a fracking site is more likely to go in next to a a, a community in a community of color next to their school rather than to the school by the golf course. So it's all you know it's all linked to the the um, you know concentration of wealth and white supremacy. But how, how, what, did, what did you see? Let's talk a little bit about your, your involvement in Earth Day um, in, the in the first Earth Day in 1970s. And, and what do you think are some of the, the things that made that so powerful, things that we could be um, doing more of now? Well, remember, after World War II, mid-40s, for the next 25 years, the American economy was booming, but it was booming at a high cost. We had auto-generated, industrial-generated air pollution that was literally killing people. I mean, when I was a student in the 1960s, played basketball for the Caltech team, you could see the pollution inside of the gym from one side of the gym to the other. It was that thick. When I finished a workout, my lungs would ache for hours from the pollution. So uh, rivers were on fire. There were oil spills. Everything got out of control. There was chemical pollution that just about decimated the Peregrine Falcon on the West Coast by, with DDT. So this had been happening throughout the 60s. And People at some point, because of this other protest movement against the Vietnam War, racial oppression, th there was also a sense in the environmental movement of that you had to fight for stuff. And that all kind of congealed in the late 60s and with the announcement of Earth Day in 1970, all of a sudden the political forces came into alignment with the social forces, you might say. And over the next five years, because, you know, I like to say politicians don't have a lot of skills, practical skills, but one is they can count. And when 20 million people turned out for Earth Day out of a population of about 200 million then in the U.S., they could count. Well, if one in 10 people is showing up, there must mean a lot of other people are out there supporting. And we then over the next five years, we passed all, almost all the environmental legislation that is in effect today, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, Endangered Species Act, and so forth, because there was a political will. And of course, one party at that time, the Democrats ran the whole Congress and had already run it for 15 years. So they could pretty much force stuff. And then the Republican presidents, uh, particularly Nixon, decided, well, there's no harm here in putting a little bit of a, a cost on industry if we're going to get a lot of public support for it. So in, in California, Ronald Reagan was governor at the U.S. level. Nixon was president. So Republicans were actually on board at that time for environmental improvement. And that lasted pretty much throughout the 70s when things began to change. So you had all these political forces in alignment and things happened quickly. And then, of course, you had to build an administrative state through e the EPA and others to enforce these laws. But we got better. And so LA County now has three times the number of people in it. 
and one fourth the air pollution. I'm sorry, one half the air pollution of that time. So that you might say, well, that's an achievement, but the fact is people are still dying of bad air. And, and, and that bad air tends to concentrate where poor people live. And that's just a fact of life in just about every city. Right, and that's, that's I think, the part that, so, so one of the things I advocate is that if you want to do something and you're not really sure how to stand up as an ally, um, that one thing you can do is go out and protect the environment, figure out a way to do that. Because anywhere that you protect the environment, it's a shared, it's a shared resource and it, it has that, that kind of um, global impact and it's our lack of standing up that has, um, that has allowed that to, to happen. And so another thing I was gonna ask you, Jerry, was one of the things I think was so interesting and powerful with around Earth Day. So somewhere in the 80s, 90s, Earth Day became more like, um, like Adam Rome in his book, The Genius of Earth Day, he says, it became more like National Ice Cream Day, where you go to an Earth Day festival and they give you like a little plastic Earth Day globe and, and stickers. And it was like, wait, this isn't, this isn't really what I came here for. But um, I was wondering, what did you, what was your experience around people from that grassroots getting together and the teach-ins um, with Earth Day? How do you think that mobilizing people from the ground up, how, how did you experience that or what did you see around that? Well, you know, I think everyone knew pollution, but where did it come from? And so the teachings were all about educating people. Where did this stuff come from? And demonstrating what you could do about it. Because obviously, if you just tell people things are terrible and that it's, it's all because of bad people running big companies, that's not good enough. You have to give people, what do I do about it? Mm -hmm. So today, because of the climate change movement, we realize that not only do we have systemic racism, we have systemic climate crisis, and that those two are now linked together. And that the young people who have come out against climate change also realizing that they're not going to get traction unless we first address this inequality in society, that there's not going to be enough support for cleaning up the environment, and that this is a lifetime project. This is why in the book I emphasize not only working on yourself, but finding that place of peace, that place of stillness within that gives you strength, because you're going to be at this for the rest of your life. I don't care what age you are today, this is going to continue for generations because we've taken generations to make this mess and we're not going to clean it up in five years or 10 years because there's too much going on. And there's a wonderful book by a, a woman, uh, Hope Yaren, who's a scientist, that just came out called The Story of More. Hmm. And it's, it's the numbers, it's well written, but it's the numbers behind the crisis we have today and how everybody in the world wants to live like Americans or thinks that they do. Um, and that means we're going to plunder the earth completely. And we know that's not sustainable. So what do we do about the natural human tendency to want to have more stuff and those of us who may be a little bit older realize that you don't need a lot of stuff to be happy. And, but there is an socially, it's like everybody wants a boat, they want another car, they want an SUV, they want an RV, they want a home by the lake, they might use three weeks a year. Everybody wants more stuff. And that is fundamentally what's driving this crisis. Right. Right. Well, that's, and I think that's a really good point. And, and I think the reason that it's very helpful, if you want to make a big impact to study those movements that have taken on things like um, slavery and apartheid and 
the farm workers, people like uh, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, um, but thinking of it as more of this long-term um, movement. And, and I think that is one thing that a lot of us who come out of more of that kind of corporate setting where we're just given a project, you do the project and you think that's, that's the end. <laughs> Um, that it, that we really do need to switch to being more of community organizers and just community focused people um, that are thinking about all the different aspects of humanity and all the different kinds of life on the planet and how we can be in fellowship and be stewards um, of all that. All right. Well, um, so I've been talking with Jerry Udelson. This is his book, uh, The Godfather of Green, and you can get it at jerryudelson.net. Um, and Jerry, thanks so much for hanging out today. It's been really interesting to, to get your perspective on this as you've been working on this um, throughout, throughout your lifetime. And is there, is there any one last little thing that you want to mention as we're, um, as we're signing off here? Well, I think that the most important thing is never, ever give up. You just don't know what will happen if you keep your effort sustained and do it with a sense of love and compassion. The world does respond to that. And that is what you have to offer more than any specific policy suggestions or movements, your own inner strength, your own inner guidance is what you have to offer. And so you have to keep offering. Well, and that, that kind of goes back to your point that, you know, in order to, to have that level of, um, of strength, then that's why you have to keep doing that, that inner work to be able to to handle whatever comes your way and be able to keep showing up day after day doing it. Well, it's like a bank account. You have to keep making deposits if you want to make withdrawals. Right. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, I'm going to hold the book up here and I'm going to take a little screenshot while we can. Wait, maybe I'll do it this way so it's not. All right. That's good. Okay. One, two, three. <laughs> okay, that's good. So now I have that for later and I will be, um, we'll be posting this. Um, oh, that's a cute picture. <laughs> um, we'll be posting this on the Green Team Academy website. And um, as we're signing off here, I just want to remind you that there's all kinds of resources for you over at greenteamacademy.com. So if you've been thinking, you know, the the environment is job number one because if we you know if we fail at the environment it doesn't matter if we succeed at everything else the environment is our our home our only home and so if you have been wanting to be more effective have a bigger impact then there's a lot of things you can do um, over at greenteamacademy.com you can sign up for my weekly group coaching program which is called team talks and this is where we get in and talk about our ideas. And I give you um, some guidance from all the teams I've worked with, as well as you have an opportunity to do your own goal setting. So we do this coaching so that little by little, you're making this thing happen. And if you want to be part of our Climate Action Challenge, we're recruiting 100 people right now to join our launch team. Our, our challenge support team, so that's ambassadors and mentors and volunteers. People want to proofread the book or be a sponsor. So there's lots of ways you can get involved with that. And um, yeah, and our goal there is to help a thousand people launch or expand their, their environmental initiative in 90 days. So what we're trying to do here is pick up the speed and, and work on these things together, support each other so we can really make a difference fast. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jerry, for hanging out today. I really appreciate um, all of your time today, but also all of your efforts um, through, 
by dedicating your life to this and by taking the time to write the book and share your insights that will be really valuable um, to all of us, no matter where we are in our careers. Thank you, Joan. You bet. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. And remember, the time for action is now because there is no planet B. We'll see you back here next Tuesday, same time, same channel. Bye.